Welcome back. We're in the second semester of our stats course. It's spring 2021. The course website is the same as before. I just added another title here, so everything's going to be in the same spot. I've updated the syllabus for spring 2021. I've added placeholders for all the labs we'll be doing this semester. All the labs we did last semester are right here, so you can use that as a reference. Most of the labs are TBD because I'll be writing them every week just like I did last semester. This week we're on lab one, shaping data, data shaping, the shape of data. We'll talk about that very soon. There's a little bit of extra news. So last semester I converted all of the labs from that semester into this uh, book down book called Reproducible Statistics for Psychologists with R. This style is maybe slightly nicer. Uh, the new labs will be put here by the end of the semester, but for now, uh, this thing is just going to sit here and remain like that. All right, let's get into it. Lab one, shaping data. Now, one thing I wanna point out about this lab is that it relates to what we were talking about last semester. One of the things we talked about a lot last semester was data simulation or simulation techniques like Monte Carlo simulation. We use that to generate sampling distributions. We use that to do randomization tests and permutation tests. And this semester, we will start looking at more complicated research designs requiring different kinds of statistical tests beyond t-tests. And as we think about these more complicated designs, uh, we'll have to understand how our data will look in terms of its implied shape with respect to those designs. Um, if we use R to create simulated data, this can be very useful for one, helping us understand the design that we want to use for some experiment, but it can also be useful for uh, doing simulated analyses. At the very end of the semester, we have Lab 11, W-Y-O-R. That stands for Write Your Own Recipes. And uh, through the rest of the semester, we're gonna be looking at traditional ways of doing statistical inference. Uh, but throughout, we'll also be talking about simulation techniques so that you can customize your own uh, st statistics tests for the research designs that, that you're doing that might be rather nuanced. Okay, so let's get into this lab. And here's what we have. First of all, I'm gonna send you to the dplyr website. Um, we've been using dplyr in semester one. Make sure you know these five different things really well. Mutate adds a new variable to a data frame. Um, select and filter can be used to select columns filter, rows, and summarize we can use to, um, you know, get means for different groups and stuff like that. So this is a very useful package for changing the shape of our data. And we, of course, will keep using this throughout the semester and I'll make sure to describe how those functions work. Related to what I'm talking about in shaping data, is a wonderful chapter called Data Transformation from the R for Data Science book. And this one is worth reading. It goes through lots of examples of using the dplyr verbs that we just talked about. All right, so in terms of some overview or background for this lab, um, I should point out that we could probably have a whole bunch of different labs on the topic of data structures and how to manipulate data, how to save data. Um, my goal in this lab is to begin to introduce something fairly straightforward, uh, which is the idea that specific designs in psychology uh, have implied data shapes. And we're going to talk about that in the practical section one. Before we get there, I have a few things to say. Um, when you're thinking about running an experiment, 
you should think about how you want to save your data. And you should think about what kind of file formats there are for saving data. We'll talk about these things over the semester. Um, the main point, one of the main points is that practically speaking, the decisions that you make about how you save your data and the format and organization that it's saved in will have consequences down the road when you try to input it into R and do an analysis. So that's one good reason to uh, think about the shape of the data when you save it. If you save it in a shape that's analysis ready when you input it back into R, you'll save yourself time later on. Um, throughout this semester, we'll be talking about the reproducible analysis pipeline. This is the idea that um, we can take some raw data file, bring it into R, and then use scripts to manipulate or transform the data all the way from its raw state through to uh, any type of analysis that we want to do or data visualization. And all, all along the way, our little fingers uh, never touch the data. So we can't make mistakes like accidentally putting a number here or there with our hands and forgetting that we did that. We can still make mistakes with our scripts because we can um, you know, make programming errors, but um, the idea is that if somebody else had your script, they'd be able to uh, input the data, run the script, and get the very same results that you got. And you know, if you have mistakes in your script, well, that's okay. At least you can possibly identify them and fix them. Now, um, the final thing for this intro lab is that understanding uh, the shape of your data is important and it's important for knowing fundamentally what your design is and what kind of analyses are appropriate to that design. So today we're going to go through a couple quick concepts. I think there's just um, one here on the concept of transformability. And then we're going to jump into some practical examples of creating simulated data with different shapes. Okay, let's get into it. So concept number one, transformability. The idea here is that if data is transformable, it can be turned into different shapes without losing any information. So let's talk about some shapes that we'll commonly find data in. Here we have the long versus wide data shape. Right, we flipped over to R, and we've been using long data uh, all last semester, so this idea is a bit of a review. First, I'm going to make some data in a wide format. And what I'm going to do is imagine we have five people and that we've measured how many times they check their phone in the morning, in the afternoon, and the evening. So let's check out how I've made a table to represent this. We've got five different people, so we've got five different rows here. And we've uh, measured how many times they check their phone in the morning, afternoon, and evening. So this would be count data. And uh, I've got some, num some made up numbers here for morning, afternoon, and evening. So if we had a design like this, a design with n equals 5, and uh, let's say one factor, time of day, and time of day, let's say, has three different levels, morning, afternoon, and evening. It's 5 by 3. So this implies that there must be 15 locations where we could put data. These are the 15 locations inside of this little table right here. And uh, each of these locations or cells corresponds to a particular person and a particular level of the factor. And this is called wide data because if we had more levels, for example, uh, let's say we did it by time of day with hours. So like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and so on. That would be many more levels. 
and if we wanted to add more levels here, the data would get wider. So let's look at a different version of the very same data. Uh, we're going to look at it in long form. So this is a reshaping of the data. We're going to take this version, shape it differently. I've got that programmed here. And let's take a look at what it looks like. So this is, as you can see, longer looking. And what's gone on here is we've got a column for each of the factors and the measurements. Um, we could talk about this as the independent variables and the dependent variable. For person, there is a column here, and the number tells you which person uh, we're talking about. Remember, each person is measured three times, so the ID, the label we use for a person, has to be, for each person, has to happen three times in order to be able to measure, capture all of the possible measurements. So person one, 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 there's three of those for morning, afternoon, and evening. And then we have two, two, two for morning, afternoon, and evening. And then for every one of these locations, we have a measurement, one, three, seven. These are the counts. Three columns. Um, and if we wanted to add more levels, so instead of morning, afternoon, evening, we went 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., etc. Uh, what would happen to this is it would get longer because there'd be more rows needed. But it wouldn't get wider. All right. Uh, a general rule for a long format is that each instance of a measurement so here's one measurement, here's another measurement, gets its own row. And uh, you, you keep uh, adding more columns to describe the factors or the situation around that measurement. So this was person one in the morning, check their phone one time. You could think about adding more things like the game of Clue. You know, it's person one in the morning in the library check their phone one time. Or in the morning in the library, while eating a sandwich, check their phone one time. You can keep adding more and more columns to represent more and more situations uh, if we wanted to. And when we do that, this kind of data will get w a little bit wider. But we call it long data because when you add more levels, the data gets longer. We're going to focus in on this code right here just to see what I was doing as I made this. So let's work through this a little bit. Um, throughout the rest of the examples, for the most part, we're going to be using wide or sorry, long data, and we'll be making simulated data using this type of style, where we create different columns in a data frame and then just by hand write down the things that we want to have happen. So I'm thinking if, um, so we can see this data frame here. I know I need a column and I want to call it person. So let's just build it like this. And in this person column, I know I'm going to need the numbers one to five. So if I did just did this, I would just get the numbers one, two, three, four, five. No, but I need each number to happen three times because each person is measured three times. So I do something like this. I use the rep function and I want to repeat each of the numbers. So I use each three times. Ooh, let's see what happened there. All right up here. Okay, so we did that. Now to see what I've done, I've just made a vector called person. It has the numbers one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five each three times. I'm gonna make another vector called time of day. And I've got this up here. 
I want to create a column that's going to have the name of the levels morning, afternoon, and evening. So if I just did this, all I'm going to get is just those three things. And what I want is that whole set. I want for person 111, I want it to go morning, afternoon, evening. And then for person 222, I want it to go morning, afternoon, evening. So I want to repeat this whole sequence. We can use rep to do that as well. And we won't use the, the each option because uh, we want to repeat the whole sequence. So let's take a look what that looks like. Morning, afternoon, evening, morning, afternoon, evening. All right, moving on to the counts. Now I just made up some numbers here, but we need 15 of them because there's 15 locations. There's 15 different counts for each of these things. All right, so what I'm going to do here is just, a, it's an alternative style to what I've done up here where I've defined each of the columns and their contents. So this is the column name, and this is the contents inside the data frame. Here I've separately defined three different vectors, and I can put them into the data frame just like this. So now when we look at the test data frame, we will see what that we've created a long form version of this. Now don't forget, when you are making these things, you are the master of your own destiny. You, you're deciding what the names of the columns are and how you're organizing things. You can make uh, mistakes when you do this and you can do things in different ways. Let me uh, give you an example. What if I wanted to get rid of this each equals three, and just put a three here. We could do that. Let's see what happens. So just to be, just to check it out, it's going to repeat the sequence one, two, three, four, five, three times. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Now, this is perfectly fine in terms of the fact that person one occurs three times, one, 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 person two occurs three times, two, 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 and so on. Every person occurs three times. And so this is a perfectly fine way to represent um, each of the different people. However, when we put it in the data frame like this, um, oh, actually, it kind of, does this work out? This is weird. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Person one is measured in the morning. Person one is measured in the evening. Person one is measured in the afternoon. Person two, afternoon. Person two, morning. Person two, evening. Three, evening. Three, afternoon. Three, morning. Whew. See, this, I'm so it's what we need to make sure is each person gets paired up with each of the times of days. And it's possible that this one actually achieves that goal. Um, let's try it this way. Now I'm making each of these different levels happen five times each. In my opinion, this is a, a much more clear on the eyes so you can see that the first or in the morning all five people are measured in the morning in the afternoon they're all measured in the evening they're all measured now uh, what i haven't done is changed the counts for any of these things and of course if i wanted to have these be the very same as uh, the other examples I'd have to move these numbers around to make sure that happens. For example, this three was previously for person number one in the afternoon. So that this three would have to move down here. And so just be careful. Uh, the decisions you make when you define, say, the first column will have implications for the decisions you make for the next columns. Okay, so that's wide and long data. 
And remember, we're talking about transformability. The purpose of the last example was just to say that if you have data in a wide format, you can transform it into a long format and back without losing any information. And converting wide to long format data is a pretty common operation. If you receive data in wide format, you're going to have to move it into long format to make use of a lot of different R functions for statistical analysis and for visualization. For example, ggplot2 wants your data in long format. The AOV function for ANOVA, the LM function for regression that we'll learn about this semester, uh, they'll want your data in long format too. So let's take a look at a function that we can use from the tidy R package that will just do this for you. All right, we're going to convert the wide data that we had made before. So here it is, wide data. And we're going to use the pivot longer function from the tidy R library. So the first thing we have to do is dip, uh, identify what data frame we want to pivot. So this one is wide data. We need to identify the columns in this data frame that we want to be made longer. So this is referring to the levels for morning, afternoon, and evening. We want to make these three columns, which are in wide format, get converted to the long format. One way of saying I want these three is to say I don't want this one. If I don't want this one, the only ones that are left are these three. So I've said not using the exclamation mark and person. So this will tell the function that I want to use all of these three columns. Now, notice in this data frame here, I've got the names of the levels, morning, afternoon, evening, but nowhere have I said a, a name to refer to this independent variable. And when we go to long format data, like here, we'll need a name, something like time of day or whatever you want to call it, that will be the name of this column. So it's asking us to supply a name for the new column that we'll make. Names to, that's what it refers to. So I'm just calling it time of day. Also, here's our counts. We're gonna need a name for this column where we're having our dependent variable. So that one is specified here under values two, and I call that one counts. So if we put all of this together and run this function, oops, I need to load the library, run the function, it converts the wide data frame to a long one. All right, the next thing that, or the, it's the last thing in transformability, it's more of a warning. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this example, but it's worth knowing that you might run into problems that I will call a custom to long transformation problem. If you're using R, you probably want to get your data into long format. And the original data might be in wide format, but it might be in who knows what format. And you might have to write a custom script in order to extract whatever that formatted data is and to then transform it into long data. So just to give an example, this is a toy example, but here we have um, a way to represent our previous data for the same example in a custom format that I just made up. So check out this format. We've got 137, so that corresponds to person number one, 137. We've got uh, 348, so that corresponds to person two, 348. Now, each person has three values. Those are separated by comma, but each person is separated by a semicolon. So this is a little system I made up. These, uh, in this case, the, there's two 
uh, delimiters here, a comma and a semicolon, and they mean different things. Now, I made all of this up, so I know what everything means. I know that this is the fifth person entry, so this must be the fifth person's data. I also made up the fact that the first number among a set of three refers to morning, and the second refers to afternoon, and the third re refers to evening. So because I know that that's what 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 these things mean, um, I can you know write a script to convert something like this into long data. Now, here's an example. I'm sure we could tidy this up. Um, I'll quickly go through it. So if we have the data here, there it is. It's just uh, it's represented as a string, a single string. And I'm not going to explain all of these R functions. I'm just going to show you an example of uh, creating a little script that will convert this data from a custom format to a long one. Now, this string split function, what it does, it will split a string by some delimiter. And I've set that delimiter as the semicolon. So this creates three little groupings of each of the persons in the data set. It's in a list structure, uh, structure, so I unlist it, and this gives me something like that. Um, next, let's see. Um, at this stage, if I split by a comma, I turn the values into another list with five elements, and then inside each list, I've got each of the values um, in, a, in, a, in a vector. Notice they're quoted, so that means they're still being treated as characters and not numbers. Now, I've, I've got to trick up my sleeves. It turns out if I use the data frame function, um, and the T function to flip it. This didn't show up very well. Oh, there we go. There's the data frame function. And then the T, let's check this out. All right, so T is a way to flip a data frame. And what I've successfully done here and is created something like a wide format of the data, 137, 348, 257. If we went back to look at our wide data, this is close to what we had here. Uh, these are still represented as characters, and these are numbers. The person column here doesn't exist over here. It's like a bunch of weird stuff from the conversions I did before. So what I'm going to do is change the column names to morning, afternoon, evening. So now we've got that morning, afternoon, evening. I'm going to change the row names to 1 to 5. Um, and I'm going to use the mutate function um, to add a new column so that we get something that looks like this. Our person column is over here now. And then we can just use the pivot longer function. And we have converted it into a long form. Now notice this is CHR. So all of these values are still characters. We would need to convert these to numbers in order for it to be exactly the same. That's an example pipeline, converting some custom format to a long format. I think being um, confident that you could do something like that's an important skill. We'll look for examples throughout the semester to give you practice doing that kind of thing. All right, let's move on to the practical section. We're going to go over one sample, paired sample, and independent sample t-tests, a little simple linear regression, and a one-way ANOVA and a factorial ANOVA. 
All right, let's move on to practical section number one. Now, just before we get started, I do want to mention a couple things. First of all, this is the first week back, so we're doing a little bit of a review here. And a lot of what we're doing today will be used throughout the rest of the semester. This is a pretty nuts and bolts part of thinking about data analysis. If you have some research design, it's going to have some number of participants. It's going to have some manipulation, some factors. There's going to be some number of measurements taken per person. Uh, whatever those values are imply that a complete set of data would have certain properties. They would have certain number of cells, locations to put the measurements. And uh, we can use R to help clarify for ourselves what exactly these implications are. Um, if to be a little bit more concrete, we're just talking about, you know, making tables and thinking about where we would put data if we collected it. We can do that formally in R. It will help us be very clear and specific about any given design we might want to run. It will help us with things like power analysis and sample size planning down the road. It will help us establish our analysis pipeline because if we can create simulated data in R, we can also analyze that simulated data. And this can be a way to prepare yourself for any data you might collect so that before you collect the data, you have a good idea about how you might analyze it. Finally, uh, creating specific kinds of simulated data that correspond to a specific kind of design, um, this basic skill can be used to create, um, used as a part of creating randomization tests or other Monte Carlo techniques for running your own um, customized statistical inference tests. So today we'll concern ourselves with some really simple goals we're going to look at a few different data structures for different designs. We want to make sure that whatever simulated data we create appropriately represents um, what is necessary for a specific design. And we also want to make sure that the data is formatted such that it can be an input to some R function. If the data is not formatted properly, the R functions won't do the statistical tests we want them to do. So let's start off with the one sample t test. Here, this is just a vector of means. And we could say, um, let's imagine a, a one sample t test with 10 values. Um, so I just randomly took 10 values from a unit normal distribution. I put them into a dependent variable and I run the t-test function on it. And so we've got a t-test. This is a stuff very similar to what we've done last semester. Let's move on. Now let's consider a design with 50 participants. So in our experiment, we're gonna have, well, maybe it's not an experiment, what is this? Uh, each participant takes a true false quiz with 10 questions. So a researcher wants to apply a one sample t-test to test whether participants perform better than chance. Okay, so we've got some numbers here. N equals 50 for 50 participants. They all do a quiz and the quiz has 10 questions. Um, in terms of measuring the participant, we measure each participant 10 times. So that means there must be uh, 500 cells in the data, right? 50 participants, times 10, 50 times 10 is 500. So what we're going to do is use R to create some type of data structure that's capable of representing the 500 uh, answers or records of performance from all of the participants across all the questions. I'm going to do this using the binomial function and a matrix. So let's flip over to R, check this out. All right, so we've seen the binomial function before. If we do this, we get 
500 zeros and ones. I've just set this up so that it's going to be a 50% chance of getting a zero or a one. This could represent whether a participant gets an answer correct or incorrect. So a zero means incorrect, a one means correct. The first 10 values, uh, however many one, however many 10 is, represents the pattern of incorrect or correct answers for participant one. And then the next 10 is for participant two and so on. If we put this vector inside the matrix function, we can convert this into uh, different, instead of one big long vector, we can have a matrix, a table with 10 columns and 50 rows. So this could represent the data from each subject. Oops, here, something like this. So V1 to 10 now represents the uh, whether it represents each of the 10 questions and whether the person got it correct or incorrect. And the rows now represent all the different participants. So there's 50 participants. All right, so we've created um, suitable data for this situation. Now, we can't input this matrix directly into a t-test because the t-test is interested in means from each participant. This is the raw data. We need to first find, for example, um, the mean percent correct, or let's not call it the, it's for each participant, we, we basically could calculate a percent correct here. That would be a summary value for that participant. So participant one is one, two, three, four, five, out of 10, so they'd get 50%, so on. We can calculate the means for each row using the row means function. And this just creates now a single vector, like this. So again, participant one had 50% correct, participant two had 40% correct, and so on. Now this summarized data is suitable for a one sample t-test, and we can run that here. All right, let's move on to a different kind of situation, a paired sample t-test. So let's consider a design measuring fluctuations in weight as a function of weekday versus weekend. I just picked this because I got a brand new digital scale that I hooked up to my phone, and my weight fluctuates across different days. I'm heavier on the weekend, it looks like, because I eat more probably. So I am I just did a little bit of me search here. And this is a totally made up example. Let's consider that we have 25 people weighing themselves five times throughout the day. And they do that on Wednesday, and they do that on Sunday. So n equals 25. Uh, we also have how many five measures on Wednesday, five measures on Sunday. So we're going to have to think about creating a, a data structure that's going to have cells, enough cells for every possible measurement for every person on Monday, or on Wednesday and Sunday. So if you think about it, there's 25 people. There's five measures and there's two days of five measures. So 25 times five times two is 250. So we're gonna create a table, a data frame with 250 rows. The first thing I'm going to do is create a subject number column. And I'm gonna do it like this. I'm gonna say for subject one, I'm going to have, I'm going to need 10 different um, I'm going to have to take up 10 rows, right? So I'm going to need the number one to occur 10 times. The first five, one, two, three, four, five, um, these will be rows for the first five measurements on Wednesday. And then these will be rows for the five measurements on Sunday. So 10 times 25 is 250. 
So I'm thinking these will be for Wednesday and these will be for Sunday. So I, I need another column that's going to have the word Wednesday five times and the word Sunday five times for and then the word Wednesday five times again and the word Sunday five times and just repeat all of that. So we can do that uh, using two of the rep functions. So the one in the middle here, let's check out what this does. This goes Wednesday, 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 Wednesday. So that's five Wednesdays and five Sundays. So that's enough to cover subject number one because subject number one does all of these measurements on Wednesday and all of these measurements on Sunday. But I want to repeat this whole thing 25 times because there's 25 different people. So I put this inside of another rep and I repeat that 25 times. And then we'll get something like this. So I'm going to put that into day just to make sure I'm doing this one too. Got that in subject number, have this in day. All right. I'm going to make another column. So we, we're, we have a subject number column, we have a day column. I'm going to call this third column measurement number. And this is going to just tell us which measurement was it the first one? Was it the second one? Was it the third one? Which one was it? So I can take our one to five. I, I want to repeat this one, two, three, four, five, because if we think about how that's going to go, subject number one is going to do a measurement on Wednesday, one, two, three, four, five. And then they're going to do a measurement on Sunday, one, two, three, four, five. So we want to do one, two, three, four, five as a sequence and repeat that two times for each person. And there's 25 people. So we can take a look at this and we basically get a whole bunch of one, two, three, four, fives in a row. Now we need a final column that represents the actual weights that have been measured. So I just took some random numbers out of a normal distribution. I took 250 of them. So this is 250 measurements and I put them into weights. We combine all of these things together, we can take a look at it. So subject number one, five measurements on Wednesday, five on Sunday.